in the beginning, sports cars were only for the very rich. But after World War II, along came MG, and the not-so-very-rich discovered it. Today's MGB has rack and pinion steering, race season suspension, four-speed gearbox, and hefty 1798cc engine. A few reasons why the MGB is the most popular MG ever built. MG, the sports car America loved first. Way back in 1922, Kimber, whom Morris had installed as manager of the old Morris garages, had taken standard Cowleys and Oxfords and hotted them up for competition use. The cars were called after the firm, MG, Morris Garages. They were enormously successful among enthusiasts. But Morris knew his cars had built a reputation because they were cheap and reliable. Racing cars then as now are neither. Yet the achievements of the MGs could not be denied. In the event, Morris relented and cut the apron strings. MGs were given their own factory near Abingdon where they were to develop their own distinctive breed and mystique. Manufacturer is a little bit of a misnomer. As far as Abingdon's concerned, we were an assembly shop. We screwed things together. We bought the car in, in partly manufactured chunks. We bought the power, power unit in, assembled, tuned, and ready to go in the car. We bought the body, trimmed, possibly even with instruments and electrics in it. I think about the only thing we made in-house in, in was the chassis frames. We had the quality control on the thing. That's really what it amounts to. We bought it together and we road tested them and made sure that they were good and right. Right from the earliest days, there had been something quite intangible, but a, a, a spirit in the place which was almost tangible. You felt it the moment you walked in. All sorts of people told us this as you, they walked into the plant. They felt that the place was alive. So I regarded it as number one charge to keep that going, come what may. But the other was, uh, of course, to keep the factory going, come what may, through its various vicissitudes and the fact that the design authority was elsewhere and it didn't seem to regard our problems as in any way urgent. And those were the sort of battles that I was fighting to try and get the successor to the TD designed by Cowley, but they didn't. Uh, so we knife and forked the TF from the TD purely to buy time while we got the MGA going. And then when we got the MGA into a producible form, then Lord trod on it because he had just bought the Austin Healey. One was very much like the other to him. They were both two sports cars. He wasn't going to be in business making two sports cars. But during the ensuing couple of years, pressure from America was such that he had to change his mind and give us permission to go ahead. When I first went there, of course, um, John Thornley was uh, the gaffer. And he was a, he was a very good director. He, let, he just let you get on with it, but he always knew what was going on. Sid Enever, my direct boss, chief engineer, was one of those guys that you never knew the line, his line of thought. He was always jumping about. His, uh, he always thought that everything was there, had been written, or was known about, if you knew where to look for it. And he was very much a self-taught guy. Um, but he would go off home and come back in and, and you would get a piece of a sugar packet or one of his kids' homework pages torn out of a book with let's try so and so or let's do this and he would alter, alter a dimension by a 64th or a 32nd or something like that 
and he always got a pretty good idea what you were doing. But once he had said, do that, and he was happy, he would let you get on with it. And like the MGB, he said, do it. And I just got on and did it, you know. And he didn't alter any lines at all. He, was, he always had his own ideas. But once you were going in the right direction, he let you develop it yourself. Sid Enneba's a genius. No question about it. For the automobile, he had a sixth sense. What did Isigonis have? A flair. I put Sydney in the same category. And I'm not saying that uh, Sydney was educated to the same level that Isigonis was. But the fact remains that uh, from an engineering standpoint, I put them pretty much on level pegging. Five years, a magic name to all who love thoroughbred sports cars. A name with a tradition, but a tradition that never rests on its laurels. It took another great stride forward in 1955 at Le Mans, that unique event where quality counts for most and luck for least. Here, the public saw for the first time a new and remarkable product of the MG stable, the prototype of the car which was soon to become world famous as the MGA. The new MG, known as the EX182, bore itself well. The critics had been curious, both because a new MG is always a major event, and because to run a prototype at Le Mans takes courage, which some might call rashness. But this was no gamble, and the EX182 proved it. Two models completed the 2,000-mile course at 86.17 miles an hour and 81.97 miles an hour, respectively. And more was to come. No sooner was the new thoroughbred in production as the MGA than the prizes began to roll in. The 1956 Alpine Rally saw the MGA winning the first ladies' prize, the Coupe des Dames, and it captured the same honor in the Mille Miglia of that year. Also in 1956, at the Liège-Rome-Liège event, the MGAs put up the best British performance, won the Newcomers' Cup and the second ladies' prize, and came second in the team prize. Not a bad record for a production model in its first year. The market was due for an update, which is why once the MGA was out of the way, Sid virtually started straight in on the, on the MGB, except that in between whiles he, he designed and built EX181, the, the record breaker. Five world records, all broken by about 20%, and five American records into the bargain. Veteran record breaker George Eiston applauds the brilliant young man who has maintained the fine tradition that Eiston and the MG experts began when Sterling Moss was a year old baby. A tradition that has been built up by a blend of creative genius and painstaking labor. A tradition which has kept MG cars in the front rank for more than a quarter of a century. Yes, this is a great achievement, but the MG people are already thinking about the next. It's that refusal to be satisfied which makes the name of MG second to none in the world. The shape of EX181, Annabeth took as the basis for the MGB. Now that sounds a bit of a long shot, but if you look at an MGB with EX181 in mind, you can see that it is EX181, but with the essentials of bumpers and headlamps and windscreens, goodness knows what all stuck onto it. But the basic shape is there. Several times I, um, we had a look-see at a replacement for the MGA. And we sent a chassis out to Italy on Harriman's instructions and the through a bodied thing came back, but uh, that is a big American styled sports car, flashy with chrome, dreadful face here, great big steering wheel, and very, very heavy. And nice though it was in its own way, we realized it wasn't the route for an MG to go. So uh, Jimmy O'Neill had already had a look see of putting a new body on the MGA chassis. 
using the very curved lines of the record breaker, e EX181, as the theme, if you like, for the body. And it was very fat and bulbous, um, probably a good shape with little fins, because fins were then in. We went from this body to several other streamlined, some versions, if you like. None of them looked right. And it became obvious that if you put a good body with more space in, you are, and you want more space, you're limited by your chassis width. And the MGA chassis was restricting us with what we can do. It was just there, beautifully strong, but it, it, you couldn't keep low and get wider. And so we realized we had to change our method of construction. And that's where, of course, some of the expertise I'd got from the body plant came in because we decided we'd have to go monocoque. Well, that let us, in fact, put a stressed underframe in because um, you don't have all the duplication of outer sill and, it, and, and chassis frame. You put it all into the sill and we designed a sill section, first of all, one of the first things we did, which was very torsionally stiff alongside a very deep central tunnel. And um, I then sat down with a fresh piece of paper and just did a new body shape, um, still trying to use some of the curves of the record breaker, but making the car wider, lower, and a bit more compact. And the MGB shape just came out. It just, just evolved on paper. A very interesting exercise is to get a roadster, open both the doors fully, and then look at it sideways on with your eye down near the ground level, and you've got two large chunks of motor car joined together by very nearly nothing. You know? And into that nothing, old Sid had designed all the beam strength and torsional rigidity, very nearly as good as if you got a top on, a stress top. Harry Herring was the model maker who worked down in development and uh, I gave him the lines of 214 and he turned it into a model very, very quickly and you could see it was, it was going to be a, a nice looking shape. I mean, I always felt it was reasonably right. John Thornley and the management looked at it and said, OK, let's go to a full size. And we were straight off then translating the lines onto a full size draft and we did it in six weeks to get it um, completely skin shaped and up to Quinton Road in Coventry and they built us a wooden model uh, exactly reproducing the quarter scale, everything, joint lines and everything. Um, and that was approved very, very quickly. Everybody seemed to, to like it. And the next stage was to get them in Coventry turning out a set of panels using the model as a base um, so that we could build the first prototype. All the work on the MGB was started using a 1622 unit as basic, uh, a two-litre Austin engine was put in there, but a lot of work was done on the V4, and this, this V4 went in very well because they decided not to proceed with that engine. So fairly late on, we were in a position of having to make our minds up what we wanted, um, and it looked like it was going to be the 1622. but. Luckily, the 1800, the Land Crab, Charles Griffin was doing, which was going to have a bigger version of the B-series engine in a transverse form. And so we were able to pick up this 1798cc, as it became, engine for the MGB fairly late on. But of course, it went in absolutely easily because we had allowed so much room under the bonnet of the MGB, there was no problem. We didn't even have to change the engine mounting positions. Rear suspension was designed to be a training arm, coil spring and pan hard rod location. And that let us put the spare wheel in a, a, an inclined position immediately behind the passenger bulkhead and the fuel tank across the car low down behind that. And the first prototype was p completed by press steel, came over to us and was built that way and went straight on to pave and road work. And two things happened. Number one, the panhard rod locating bracket tore off the chassis fairly quickly because of the corner stress we were putting on the car because Tommy Haig was our test driver and he, uh, he really pushed the car pretty hard. The other thing, of course, was that the uh, panhard rod gives a steer effect from the rear because the car actually um, 
feels the radius of action of the panhard rod, and therefore the axle is moving sideways relative to the body, or the body is moving relative to the chassis, and you can feel it. And that wasn't really a, a feeling that he liked. Sid tried it and Roy tried it, and they all agreed that, in fact, this was, in fact, uh, not acceptable. So fairly late on, when the body tooling was well on, it was decided that we would go to semi-elliptic rear springs, which meant that we had to stretch the back of the body and lay the spare wheel down as well. So the car actually finished up an inch longer, just an inch longer, and so I had to redo the body lines very rapidly as well. The trailing arm car, although it was never proceeded with, was the best. It was much quicker around the corners. But the, when we went to the uh, cart spring, it was slightly worse, but still much better than the MGA on the corners. And so we had succeeded in the criteria that the car was drivable, it understeered very slightly uh, initially, but oversteered fairly safely, tapped you on the shoulder and said, look, I'm going, and let you take your foot off, and then nothing happened. You just sort of straightened up. The aficionados would like to have seen it several hundred weights lighter. Um, but of course, it had, if it had been several hundred weights lighter, it would have been so many more, hundred pounds more expensive. It was that almost ideal compromise between sporting appeal and reliability and cost. Rough times, the octagon spirit seizes pedestrians as well. Then you find yourself surrounded by ardent admirers. Get the octagon spirit. Removable hardtop or soft top convertible. Get an MGB. The B got good reception in 62, and production just went up and up and up until we were producing, what, 40,000 a year to America and only uh, about 5,000 for the UK. Something different, something exciting. That's what made MG the sports car America loved first. MG, still one jump ahead. The MGB achieved a lot of success in its time, but of course you have to keep in mind that at the time, although the competition department was based at Abingdon and therefore was in an MG environment, I mean the table mats were octagonal shaped, I think if they could found a machine the fish and chips would have come in octagonal shapes, it was all very much MG biased, but the money was coming from the BMC competition committee which was fed, led by George Harriman with Alec Isigon as a major player on it, and to some extent therefore any MG activity was almost a sideline. I don't want to sound patronizing. It was an important sideline, but the main thrust was very much, once we got a winning car with the Mini, and to a lesser extent with the Healy 3000, the MG was just something rather nice. And Sebring is a classic example. To go racing in Florida once a year, it was almost, we almost chose the drivers as a something of an end of term treat. You know, marvelous days to go to Sebring because Donald and Jeff Healy used to take uh, sprites for the three hour race and then we take MGBs or previously MGAs for the 12 hour race but we put drivers in partly on their ability as racing drivers we, we didn't take total incompetence but there was an element of so and so has done pretty well for us this year with minis or whatever on rallies well let's take them to Florida and have a race in the MGB because let's face it if you're up against Ferraris and Porsches at 12 hours on an airfield it it didn't really matter who was in the MGB, it was only going to be going for its class wins, it wasn't going to win outright, and therefore there could be a, an end of term party element about it. Routine pit stops for tires, fuel, and driver change begin. Team managers flag in their cars and mechanics snap too. Low oil pressure is plaguing the MGs. Number 48 is already out with run bearings. Cobra and Corvette activity is furious. Both makes are bothered with minor ailments, adding frustration to the intense Chevrolet Ford rivalry. The reason that the MGB had the success it did, I think, was 
quite simply because of its simplicity. It was a very simple car, therefore it was easy to prepare, it was therefore very reliable, it was a very forgiving car, it was very easy to drive, it was a fairly viceless car, whereas people would get into the Mini and some people would struggle with the front wheel drive and the more you put the power into the Mini, the more they struggled. The Healy 3000, I mean, what did you say about it? It was just a marvellous, glorious, thunderous, smelly beast. But there were lots of people, and I was one of them, if it was a hint of rain on the road, it should never have been allowed out without a special licence. I mean, it, but it was a unique animal with a lot of character. The MG just sat there as a safe, manageable, simple, effective car. Never going to win things outright, but eminently capable of picking off enough things to hang advertising around. In two seconds now, the race will be on from its running start. Twenty-two, that's Park's Ferrari, which this time tomorrow is to finish third. But don't imagine 24 hours at Le Mans is devoted even principally to motor racing by the hundreds of thousands who come here for this great jamboree. I liked Le Mans, I could see its importance, but it was again a side issue, but there was far more input from Sid. You remember the, one of the MGs got the special front end on, and there are photographs around of Sid Enova involved in that sort of design of the car. Everything we did, I hope, was important because we were trying to create pegs for the marketing department and we were trying to create technical lessons for the engineering people. But it was not of major importance. We were all very thrilled when it was the best British car at Le Mans, but I mean, to some extent, the fact that you could finish in the teens and still be the best British car at Le Mans said more about the number of car, British cars at Le Mans than the MGB. Paddy Hopkirk in the NGB number 39 reckons this is the only interesting spot on the circuit. The Rover BRM, classed as a two-litre, has built up only a five-lap lead on the Spitfire. Both triumphs are still virtually on the same lap, and the pitch reports everything under control. The MGB 1800 of Hopkirk and Hedges has stolen one lap on the Triumph, and the three now split the Alpine. Paddy, of course, We'll have a go with anyone. With the Mini, it was very much factory-led. We were calling the tune. With the MGB, outside influences, like the private owners, tended to play more of a part. Because it was so reliable, there might be a car in the workshop that had done a sort of six-hour something or other, but not quite just with an oil change, but very nearly with an oil change, was capable of doing another six-hour. In the four GTs, Andrew Hedges' MG joins the Spitfire Alpine party. And with the MG leading, Slotemacher and Tunner let the opposition make the running for a while. Andrew Hedges, with the MG, leads the bigger class. I think the philosophy of, of MG always was built to build a car which was a drivable, handleable motor car, which was safe and, and, and nice to drive, which anybody could drive, and go into to a moderate form of competition if they really wanted to, and go into a more severe forms by using special development, and that was the way it always was. It was a 42-hour dash from Kabul to Bombay, and now the principal hazard was not so much the terrain as the people. From the Pakistan frontier to Lahore, the roadside line of spectators was almost unbroken and grew thicker with every mile. Andy Kyan and the Hunter were handily placed, and Jean Denton was still fresh despite a hard ride in her never-entered MGB. I was at Silverstone for the production car race, and there were three DB24 Astons running as a team, one behind the other. And I was very smitten by this shape. I said, that, that, that's, that's the shape that we ought to go after. And from that moment on, that, that, that's what I set my eyes on. The MGA didn't quite work out that way, largely because I was, wasn't looking at the time, I think, really. 
uh, and, and anyway, Sydney had his own ideas, and I wasn't going to stop him midstream. But we got around to it uh, finally. When he uh, designed the MGB, he had in mind that I wanted to put a top on it. <laughs> and then, having got the roadster into, com into a commission, um, we tried so hard to put a top on it, and it <laughs> every time it looked wrong. And so, finally, we uh, sent the thing to Italy, to Farina. When it came back, we said, that's it, you know. In, in, uh, uh, once, we had tried to, to retain the ordinary roads to windscreen, so that we wouldn't have to uh, repress the windscreen surround and all the rest of it, and have, have special screen grasses, and goodness knows what, all sorts of costs would follow. The fact remains, it made the difference between a hideous looking motor car and a beautiful one. And everybody fell for it, and it was exactly right. I mean, raising the windscreen two inches made all the difference, of course, to the amount of light in the car. Beautiful looking machine. It's an MGB GT. Must really take off. Oh, sure it does. But its racing suspension hugs the road beautifully. What made it go? A race-proven 1798cc engine and a fully synchronized four-speed stick shift. I'd love to look inside. Oh, oh, go ahead. See? Full instrumentation, bucket seats that recline, and a back seat that folds down for extra luggage space. It's almost a contemporary classic. Oh, MGB GT is one of a kind. Traditional luxury with sports car performance. This is living. When we were designing the B, we didn't um, think in terms of the V8 power unit, but we did think in terms of the six-cylinder. And that is why, partly why, on the, the MGB, you'll find such a big space between the front of the engine and the back of the radiator. That was allowed for the other two cylinders when the time came, because we reckoned that the MGB would be replacing the big Healy. John Thornley, director and general manager, drives an MGB with Sidney Enever, chief engineer of the BMC sports car division. Their job is to build all four of the BMC sports cars, Austin Healy 3000, MGB, Austin Healy Sprite, and MG Midget. With Cecil Cousins, works manager, they have been building sports cars down at Abingdon for well over 30 years. Their slogan, Safety Fast, is known throughout the world, and it is something more than a slogan. High performance with safety has become a tradition justly attached to all the products of Abingdon. Well, they were talking about uh, replacing the big Healy, so they said to me, can you do a Healy version of an MGB, and which is also an MGC? So that, in fact, there is a, a lot of rationalization in there. And I did ADO 51 with a Healy-type radiator on, but um, Donald Healy did not want a car which was an MGB design running around with his name on it. No, he said a Healy is a Healy. Sid Enever went to Ezegonis and said, yeah, OK, with a six-cylinder engine, but it is about an inch and three-quarter inches too tall. Um, here's a layout using so that we can get it into the MGB much more nicely but it, you'll get a bit more chance to make it breathe. But Izzy Gonis would not alter it one little bit, and so we were given this great big heavy six-cylinder power unit to get into the B, hence the big bulge for the MGC and the very forward radiator. I felt sorry in a way because Alec Izzy Gonis, a total genius, again, think about the Mini, things are simple and as uncomplicated as MGB. I don't say that they were beneath him, but there was not a lot of enthusiasm there. I mean, if we if it had a three wheels, or it had been front wheel drive, or it had been four wheel drive, or whatever, his eyes might have lit up, but it was, oh, oh, don't bother me with that sort of thing. When the engine arrived, it was 70 pounds heavier than we had been told. Put that into the car, and it promptly knelt down, you see. So the, the, the way out of that was to stiffen the torsion bars, wind up the suspension. But it produced a motor car which had a very marked tendency to go straight on at corners. 
Hands are marvelous things. They can put together something as rugged and reliable as a front disc brake, or as precise as a carburetor. They can assemble a four-speed all synchro mesh gearbox, or guide a race-proven engine into an all-steel monocoque body. There are over a thousand pairs of hands at Abingdon, England. Together, they build the MGB. MG, the sports car America loved first. Obviously, um, the American regulations from 69 onwards got more and more severe. Um, and really, it's, it's those which affected the MGB right to the end of its production. Five, four, three, two, one. That's 30 miles an hour to zero as it happens, with the total action taking just under one-tenth of the second. Vehicle crash tests are complicated affairs, and preparation of the vehicle begins on the floor of the experimental department up to two weeks before a test. Vehicle test J81 is scheduled as a complete vehicle test with airbags in both driver and passenger positions. Initial preparations complete, the car is trailed to the Mayara crash facility near Nani. With the car at the concrete block in its initial impact position, the high-speed cameras can be positioned to ensure complete coverage of the crash. Impact speed, 30.4 miles an hour. Not fast, you may think, but the results are dramatic and intensely interesting. This is what the high-speed cameras recorded. A deployment that meets the allotted time schedule of 30 milliseconds and from the electronic readout, a low level of dummy deceleration. I had to do that very special car, SSV-1, safety systems vehicle. They just said, we're going to do a car which will show the British attitude to safety. And our particular brief was to get safety systems into a very small vehicle. It's all very well doing it in a great big car, but can you do it in a confined space? So um, they just gave me an MGB and said, we want to do several things in terms of padding and safety. We have a suggestion from the brake people that they have got a ride leveling system, which is very, very safe and very, very good. And this is uh, the Lockheed people at uh, Levington. And they had got a ride leveling system they were using on ambulances, but they said they could do it on a much smaller motor car. We built that suspension all onto a Rover, one of the last 2,000 TCs or something like that, and did um, the comparison of handling with a, with a Chevrolet. And so we had front and rear suspension completely different to the MGB built into the car, and crash padding everywhere. We filled the sills, the outer part of the doors, and the outer part of the wings under the, under behind the splash plate and the rear. Uh, and up to the pillars with a crushable stiff foam and we actually did a side impact test and did a film for the exhibition where we ran an MGB into an MGB sideways on at uh, 15 miles an hour and we did an ordinary car and the intrusion was about four and a half inches at the uh, inside door panel face. We modified the car with all this foam and the intrusion was half an inch. So it was obviously an, an enormous improvement on one of the routes you could go. We also did the big rear view mirror. The idea was that you should have absolutely panoramic rear vision and there isn't any way you can do it through a backlight with a normal mirror. So you have a periscope system up onto the roof this great big unsightly mirror which added about a couple of square feet to the frontal area as well. Working with Smiths we did head up speedo reflected in the uh, windscreen so you could actually see the speed in the windscreen on a, a reflective patch and I see that in the paper this week they're talking about doing exactly that and we actually did it in 1972. We also had um, a Triumph system in the car which cut out the ignition and um, that you had to key four numbers in, but you had to do them in a certain time as well before the, you could actually make the car work. So you put the key in, turn it, and key in this number, and the car would go. It had the first of the soft, low bumpers on the car. That The idea was we have a bumper which hit the people way below the knee, 
so that it tips you over onto the car. And the car having a big, long, clean bonnet, if you hit the panel, you'll dent the panel, but you won't hurt yourself too much. There is a kind of man who wants more than basic transportation in a car. He wants something quick and responsive, with reflexes that match his own. Quick and responsive, the kind of qualities that made MG the sports car America loved first. MG, still one jump ahead. The first of the bumpers, of course, was the great big overrider, so you could run into a wall at um, five miles an hour, into a, just purely a forward impact of five miles an hour, and that was what we called the Sabrina bumpers, the great big rubber thing added onto the override with a big casting in behind to take the load. That only lasted for one year, and uh, the next year you had to have a bumper which was between 16 and 20 height. You had to swing a great big pendulum nose into it on the corners at 45 degrees as well as forward, and the car had to run into the block at five miles an hour with no um, mechanical damage to the car major operating parts. In other words, the engine must still operate okay and not touch anything, and all the lights must be okay. The car must be drivable. And so that's when we went to the great big moulded bumper. Inside every MGB is a beautiful surprise. At no extra cost, MG gives you the sun, the sky, the wind in your hair. Not to mention a four-speed stick, front disc brakes, rack and pinion steering, and the race-proven MG engine. There is a big, wide world out there, and you can see it all in the MGB, the wide-open sports car from British Leyland. Costello obviously started that ball running. He was doing, getting engines and building the converted Vs. And um, Harry Webster got hold of the Costello and sent it to us and said, well, let me have a report on this car. What do you think of it? And can you do me one? And Roy Brocklehurst and Barry Jackson uh, were up and running. We got an engine from the Range Rover and dropped it in the car. Within six weeks, we had a car up to him actually up and running and it got management approval very quickly. And that was in 1972, with the autumn of 72. Production was scheduled, um, press release for August 73. And in July 73, Roy Brocklehurst uh, said to me, oh, we've got to go to Longbridge. And he wouldn't tell me why. And I was in the car and he said, okay, he said, I'm going to work at Longbridge, your chief engineer. Um, you've got to launch the V8. That went into production very easily. There were no great problems. It was accepted very well. But of course, it didn't run that long because number one, we never got more than 48 engines in any one week. We just couldn't get engines for it. And the insurance and petrol problem all blew up at that time. And that all conspired against the car. So it was just about changed into the rubber bumper car in 75 and the model year change. And it went out of production. Sun in a topless MG or Triumph. They're waiting for you now at your British Leyland sports car dealer. We were obviously aware in 1978-79 that we were holding volume of production just about, but we needed more performance because the emission regulations with, with the addition of a catalyst that meant we'd only got something like 67 horsepower available instead of about 90 horsepower available at the MGB. And so the American cars wouldn't pull the skin off a rice pudding. They were, they were dreadful. So we had to do something. And we had got the O-Series engine coming along at the time. And in fact, the first O-Series engine was in an MGB GT a long, long time ago. But we started work on what was called the Chrysler Lean Burn System, which was buying the knowledge from America, from the Chrysler people, and it was a printed circuit board which modified your carburetor system through the whole rev range. It worked reasonably well. 
and we were fairly well on the way down the road when we were told to change courses because Lucas could do something even better. And Lucas had got uh, a 12-cylinder version of an emission regulation with the Jaguar. Uh, but we were able to take four cylinders worth of this in the MGB. So we had an O-series fuel-injected car in standard form, a two-litre, which was producing, with full emission equipment, 112 horsepower instead of 67. So that we got a pretty quick motor car again. And it, because the B, a standard B, was going to be quicker, we modified the front brakes, improved the front brakes, we modified the front springs, we altered the roll bars, and, and we actually built a whole series of prototypes for the O-series program. And I sent six uh, out to the States, and the B got the best results we'd ever achieved from a North American car. It was the quickest car they'd ever had over there. The emissions were, were passing all the regulations easily, because fuel injection let you do it. And we'd also got a twin car retro version running for the European market, because we always thought we should go back into Europe if we had a car which was quiet enough and had got the right emissions levels. And, and uh, the O-series seemed to be, the, obviously, the, the time to do it. At the same time, we had been looking at the, uh, the midget, and the midget production had gone down, but that was using, of course, a marina engine, which was common with a Spitfire. And I understood that the, the Spitfire was going to finish, so the midget was going to finish anyway. So our concentration had to be on the MGB. America is coming home in the shape of things to come. Politics said that they wanted to get the TR7 running in the States as well, and they'd already looked at the TR8, the V8 version of that. They were obviously doing parallel work, and rationalization said that they ought to go with the latest car. So I think the decision was made at that point that the MGB would have to finish. And if the MGB finished and the midget, and the midget was going, then there was no production for having them, therefore having them would, could possibly close. And the only exercise we had done was the interim one, which was ADO 21 which was the mid-engine mid car we did. When Triumph were doing the TR7, we were asked to look at a, a new MG, and we weren't allowed to use the X234, which was the platform frame A-series car, which Roy Brocklehurst did. I think it was in the idea of competition in those days. They said, OK, Triumph, go ahead with a conventional car. Let's get MG to look at mid-engine, because that was the name of the game in the Grand Prix cars, if you remember. And so we actually uh, took um, an MGB GT and cut the middle out of it and put an E-Series across the back of it. So we were actually pushing the car along with a big Dadean tube. Um, we actually built a prototype and it handled reasonably well. Had all the problems of long pipes from the radiator at the front and the throttle linkages. But um, Harris Mann, and Paul Hughes did the styling for ADO 21, which was way out styling, completely really impractical for a, a road car, in my opinion. And we weren't too happy. We're, we did the car because we were told to, and um, we could have made it work reasonably well, but it would have needed an awful lot more development time than we were ever allowed. It was a big family. I mean, being an Abingdonian myself and before the war, being at school there, you just knew everybody. We had three and four generations of families in, in the factory. And we just didn't have strikes. I mean, people got on with it. I mean, they used to have rows about things. Everybody did. But everybody said, no, you can build motor cars in the end. You sort out your own problems, you know. And that's the, the, the management talked to the uh, shop stewards. Uh, any opportunity and every opportunity. I only ever had one meeting with a shop steward, Eric Brin, the senior shop steward, in the whole time I was there, which was a problem which it needed resolving about the mechanics going out and what uh, rate they were to be paid at when they were away from the factory because of what was happening in other factories. It wasn't something we generated ourselves. It was a comparison. It was resolved in about an hour. So it was a good place to work. People did talk and they got on. And 
everybody was always interested in what was going on and you, you, everywhere, at every level. Well, I mean, an awful lot of it was the fact we never had conveyor railway production lines. The cars were always pushed up by hand. And when they finished a section, somebody was a bit slow, you'd hear, push them up, push them up, and coming down the thing, and the, the cars would move a bit quicker down the line. It was easy because we built a car a man a week. When we were building 1,100 cars a week with 1,100 people. It was that sort of size of operation. There are four basic ingredients in building a car body. It's the press tools that make the, the panels, the jigs that hold them together, the equipment to weld them together, and the people who know what they're doing. Well, the starting point, and that was a Christmas holiday, I took home the PP&A sheets, as, as I would know them, the production parts and assemblies, detail sheets, and broke them down. And then, armed with this list, went back in uh, to Swindon primarily, because that's where most of the tools were, and started hunting around their, their dye parts looking for these tools. Once we'd established that the bulk of the dyes were, were present, it was a logical step to say, well, we ought really to be producing a body shell. But the other thing you need, having got the bits that make the car, the pressings that make the car uh, from the, the dyes, you need the jigs and fixtures which hold the various parts in the right relationship to each other. Uh, we were lucky again in finding some of the jigs, some of the major jigs, uh, not all within the original producing factory either, uh, and those jigs we brought to Farringdon and refurbished. Having got the dies and jigs, the equipment we've uh, borrowed, um, acquired from the various plants, again massively expensive, uh, each of the transformers and timers uh, that we need and we've got 18 on the MGB, uh, is £12,000 new. You then need to get all the, K, all the uh, power, uh, both high voltage and the ordinary 240 volt, water, uh, air to each of the guns, and you need steel to hang them on, the welding guns. So it's, it's a very expensive uh, business to actually put in a welding operation as we have done. We were lucky in that we situated ourselves deliberately midway between Oxford and Swindon, which are uh, where the skills that we needed to produce a body shell uh, existed. Mostly in, at the start were people who'd retired after 20, 30, 40 years in the factories, took early retirement, uh, and we've tempted them back out of retirement.
we pursued the idea of building a car, but it was decided that Heritage was not in a position to actually produce a car itself. Uh, there will be difficulties within Rover of one of its companies producing a car. So for that reason, it was shelved. We do the complete body shell from, for the RV8. We ship it to Cowley for final assembly, paint and final assembly. And the body that leaves here is prepped, ready to go directly into their paint shop with no other work on it. So it's a, it's a major undertaking for ourselves. We also have reintroduced for the RV8, but they will also be usable on earlier MGBs, the main front cross member to which all the front suspension is attached, the gearbox cross member, the pedal boxes, window winder regulators, so a number of things that will benefit the heritage MGB, if I can call it that, as well as the, the latest RV8.